The biggest investment you probably own is your home. But do you utilize your home in your overall retirement plan? Do you have rental real estate? If you're curious about how real estate will fit into your overall retirement plan, this is the show for you. We're getting real with real estate today, folks. Welcome. The show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. My name is Joe Anderson. I'm a certified financial planner. And of course, I'm with the big man. He's sitting right over there. Big Al and I work for a company called Pure Financial Advisors. Big Al's been in the real estate investing world for over 30 years, so this is by far his favorite show of all time. So you're in for a treat, and I'm gonna be bored sick. But here's the stats. 79% of individuals that are 65 years of age or older own a home. So do we utilize that home in your overall retirement? That's today's Financial Focus. Take a look at this chart here. This is showing net worths of individuals and families here in the US depending on their age. So 165,000 is total net worth of 55 to 64 year olds, but 67 is liquid. So what does that tell us? $100,000 is in real estate, is in their primary residence. So as you can see, most of individuals' net worth is in their home or in property. Are we utilizing that property to create income? Should you even do it? What is the answer? That's why we have Big Al. Let's bring him on right now. So today we're getting real with your real estate. We're gonna talk about your home equity. We'll start there because four out of five of you that are near retirement age or in retirement actually have a home. Then we wanna talk about rental properties. How does that fit in? Some of you have rental properties, should you keep them? Others of you are thinking, gosh, maybe I should buy a rental property. Maybe that's a good idea for my retirement. We're gonna hop into that. And then finally, we'll get into IRAs, real estate in your IRAs. Is that a good idea? And Joe, I think, uh, I think this is a pretty interesting topic because a lot of people think real estate is a great and easy tool. It, you can make a lot of money with it. It's not as easy as a lot of people think, but nevertheless, a, a lot of people have homes and they need to know how to use them. Well, I mean, you and I live here in Southern California. The prices of homes here are a little bit higher than most areas in the country. Correct. And I think a lot of times people want to be like this real estate mogul. And so should they do it, right? It's right. like real estate is a very interesting asset class and a lot of us already own real estate. And so when you look at it, should we utilize some of that real estate that you currently own in your primary residence? There's a couple of ways to do that. You can downsize your current residence and say, hey, I have this bigger home. Maybe I downsize into a condo. Uh, maybe it's just a one or two bedroom. All the kids are out of the house. Or if you want to stay in the house, potentially there's something that you can do called a reverse mortgage. Al, let's talk a little bit about downsizing. Yeah, and downsizing, Joe, that's, that's an important concept. And I think what happens is, as you mentioned, I mean, for folks in Southern California or any high cost real estate area, you probably end up with real estate being your biggest asset, as we just saw. And a lot of financial planners say, don't, don't utilize it. You look at other things. And we're going to tell you, if you live in a high cost area, you don't necessarily want to ignore it. Now, downsizing, we know from the stats, a lot of you, a lot of you don't want to move. But the truth is, if that's where the majority of your, your equity is, is you at least may want to consider it. And downsizing simply means moving to a cheaper place in your current locale, or Joe, maybe moving to another cheaper place out, outside your high cost area. The, an example is pretty staggering as to what it can mean. Here's an example, $700,000 home, All right? Let's say you have a mortgage here of a couple hundred thousand dollars. You downsize, you say, you know what? We want to get rid of this big house and we're going to purchase something for about $400,000. We get rid of this mortgage, all right? We got some home equity here. Right now, the home equity is four hundred thousand because you paid cash. You got rid of your mortgage payment, and guess what? You freed up another hundred thousand dollars. So, if you do the math here, right? So, you got rid of this mortgage payment of fourteen hundred dollars a month, plus you added another hundred thousand dollars of liquidity. So, if we use that four percent rule that we used before, that could generate another four thousand dollars of income. But then if I look here, you freed up another, what, close to $17,000, $18,000 
plus four, this could be $21,000 of additional cash flow just like that, just by downsizing into a little bit smaller home. Just think about it. Maybe you have a smaller home, it's a little bit more cramped, but you got a lot more cash to get the heck out of the house, right? You can travel, you can do different things, spoil the grandkids, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, and I think that's important because a lot of folks feel like they're stuck. And, and the truth is, if you look at your real estate maybe in a little different way, then you can perhaps have a little bit better retirement. And of course, then you're gonna be considering about taxes because a lot of people think it's the old rule. Once in a lifetime exclusion on real estate, that, that's been gone for 20 years. So right now we have a section 121 exclusion, which simply means this. If you sell your home, you've lived in it for a couple of years and, and, uh, and owned it for a couple of years out of the last five, then you get a $500,000 exclusion exclusion for a couple and a $250,000 exclusion for an individual. So realize that in this example we just did, if you had a home for $700,000, uh, maybe you bought it for $300,000, there's a, maybe a $400,000 gain, but if you're married, you get an exclusion, you pay zero tax on that. Another thing that you might want to consider too, if you want to stay in the larger home and you have that mortgage and you want to get rid of that mortgage payment, or maybe it's debt free and you're looking to generate additional cash flow, uh, you could do a reverse mortgage. There's something that's called a HECM, a home equity conversion mortgage. Right, so this is not your conventional mortgage where you're paying a mortgage payment to it, it's just in reverse, where you could take capital or get a payment stream for the rest of your life. All it does is build up that debt with inside the equity of your home that you'll never pay back. Once you pass or sell the home, then right, you, you just take whatever that note is minus the equity and then that would go to the heirs or that's what you would receive as cash as you purchase another home. There's also private reverse mortgages here too. So if you don't wanna conform with um, the HUD uh, within the HECM, you could do something a little bit different. Alan, these are a little bit bigger, a little bit more non-conforming, but there's always opportunity for people if they wanna take a look. Well, there are, and, and so when, when it comes to the conforming loans, you're, you're somewhat limited as to how much you can borrow. And typically, it's, it's based upon the HUD uh, rates for your area in terms of the maximum loan. And you gotta have usually about 50% loan to equity or 50% equity, I should say, at least in your property to make this work. Probably most importantly, though, you gotta be 62 years of age. Uh, you need to uh, live in the home as your primary residence. And you need, if you have debt on the home, this home equity, I mean, this reverse mortgage needs to pay off that debt. Go to yourmoneyorwealth.com. We have a great real estate guide for you today. Go to uh, yourmoneyorwealth.com, click on that special offer, and we can run down everything that we're talking about today in regards to real estate, should you purchase, not, rentals, heckums, everything in between. Don't go anywhere, we're just getting started. Show's called Your Money, and it's your wealth. Welcome back to the show. The show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. Joe Anderson and Alan Klopine here hanging out. We're getting real with real estate today. So if you're interested in rental properties, changing your primary residence into a cash cow by using a reverse mortgage or downsizing or whatever. Before we get into the meat, let's see how you did on the true false question. You no longer have to pay property taxes or insurance with a reverse mortgage. Uh, Joe, that's false. Uh, nice try. Reverse mortgage, you still have to pay your other expenses. And in fact, if you don't, uh, your loan's gonna be in default and they're gonna, they're gonna ask you to pay it back or sell the property. So well, yeah. That's where people got into problems. That, right? was, that was one of the ways. Because yeah. I mean, I think a lot of times people use a reverse mortgage as the last resort. Sure. Everything is gone. So let's just, you know, mortgage out the house and then they don't have any cash to pay the property tax or insurance. Right. And then it's like, uh-oh, now what? And so yeah. you get and the And so, so now as a result of that, they put more restrictions on how much money you could take out so that there's some left over to be able to pay those bills. So there you go, there right? There you go. Uh, hey, let's talk a little bit about Alan's passion. Yeah, real estate. Real estate. Um, how about investment properties? You yeah. know, I think a lot of times when people are building um, a retirement plan, they might be, hey, I, like, I don't like the volatility of stocks. Bonds are boring. Let's get into real estate. I can drive by and I can see it. 
You know, that we hear that quite oh, often. That's right. I can touch it. I, know I can it's, touch I, it. I can look at it's it. It's not going anywhere. Right. Right. It was worth 500. Now it's worth two. But you can still, I can still touch it. You can still touch it. still touch it. Right. So the, the thing I, I would say right off the bat is, do you want to be a landlord in retirement? And <laughs> because it's like and I've been a, a landlord myself for 30 years. So it's like being a business owner. If you want to own a business in retirement, then by all means, if you want something to do, if you enjoy that kind of thing, you may get phone calls any time of the night. You may have to have a weekend day where you're going and repairing the property. So if that appeals to you, then fantastic. And, and I'm here to tell you, you can make a lot of money in real estate. And, and Joe, maybe we'll get into this. And you can lose a lot of money and I, in real and estate. And I have done both. And I'll tell, I, I'll tell you both. It's, it's actually, it's not like the late night people say it is. It's, it's a little tougher. Uh, here's a real quick, when, when you're looking at purchasing maybe a, a, an investment property, just back of the envelope, what we look at is cash on cash. There's a lot of different terminology of how you might want to look at it. Al can get in the specifics of cap rates and things of that nature. But here's something really easy. You look at your rental income, right? What is, let's just look at property one. You got to look at your rental income. Maybe you're getting a couple thousand dollars a month, but that's not your net Right, hey, I'm getting $2,000 a month, everything's great, but guess what, you have expenses. If you have a mortgage on it, right, you got repairs, you have to do different things to the overall property. Let's just assume this property has about $19,000 of um, expenses. So you're netting $5,000 a year. Okay, you're thinking, well, that's not that good, but let's just say that you have only $100,000 of equity. Well, $5,000 into 100 grand, that's 5%. Cash on cash, that's a pretty good return when you're looking at a rental property. Now let's go to this one. Hey, I have higher rent, so this one has to be a better property, right? Because I'm only getting $2,400 here. I'm getting $30,000 over here, so this could be a better property because I'm getting more rents. But guess what? In some cases, you might have more expenses, right? You have a larger mortgage because it could be a nicer home, right? Now your cash on ca or your, your um, net is 2000 bucks. You have to look at your net equity, right? A lot of times we're looking at what's the gross value, what's the market value of the home. You have to look at your equity. In this case, let's say the equity in this home is 200,000. Well, 2,000 into 200 grand is 1%. So even though I'm getting higher rents, my cash on cash return is 1%. So I think people look at the different variables wrong. Hey, look at the market value of this home. Look at I'm getting more rents on this home, so it must be a better home. You have to do the math. Well, you do, Joe, and that's true whether you actually own the property or whether you want to buy a property because it's it's all about cash flow. And of course, there's other factors too, but if cash flow isn't there, forget about it. But in terms of some of these other factors, gosh, make sure that you can get some good finance and get a good loan. Make sure you have some resources in case something goes wrong. Don't be stretched too thin. And then take a look at where the property is located. Does it have good appreciation potential? How's the local economy? How's the neighborhood doing? How's the condition of the property? Is it a fixer upper? Are you good with tools or not so good? Those are a lot of things to think about, Joe. But the first part is cash flow. It doesn't even make sense right. to own it. And if you don't want to do the maintenance of it, right, or get the phone calls and all of that, you can have a property manager. But right. just know that that's going to reduce your cash on cash return. That's just added expenses. Yeah. And, and when it comes to maintenance, we get this question all the time is like, what's what's appropriate? And so everyone wants to fix up the kitchen or the bathrooms. Do that for your own home, not your rentals. It doesn't really pencil out very well. What does pencil out is painting the home, fresh coat of paint, maybe cleaning the carpet, maybe replacing the carpet, but that's probably about all you wanna do. Make sure things are working. Yeah, you don't wanna put marble, right, in, in the home that you're renting out. Um, let, let's look at what cash flow is a little bit better, all right? So here's your bread and butter homes. Al, what's a bread and butter home? Well, that's like a working class home. You tend to have better cash flows than maybe the luxury neighborhoods. Right, because if I got a luxury home, this might have a lot larger market value than my bread and butter, right? But this might not cash flow, right? Because the rents, you might not get enough rents just to cover the overall market value. Um, smaller apartments is gonna be a lot better than homes and condos. And then inland properties. So we live in San Diego. So a lot of times we see, oh, we wanna get beachfront properties and rent it out. Well, it's probably not going to pencil out. So if you're near the ocean or maybe a lake or something very nice, those homes are a little bit more expensive. You have to do the math. In most cases, Al, we look at it, the cash on cash return or cap rates are a lot lower than just your standard bread and butter, you know, inland, nice family community 
um, home that's that's going to be significantly less market value than here, but but your your return is a lot higher. Yeah, and I think everyone wants to buy that nice home near the beach and call that their rental property, but generally those don't pencil out as well. Now, if you have a property and you realize, gosh, this isn't very a good retirement asset because the cash flow is not very good, then you got four potential ways to sell it. You can do an outright sale. You pay the capital gain. That can be okay if it's a low enough gain or you got passive loss carry forward. So that's something to consider. Uh, number two is you can do an installment sale. You just pay the tax slowly over time and you become the bank. You collect payments over time. You could do 1031 exchange. You could exchange into another property that has maybe better cash flow without paying the tax currently. Or you can do what's called a charitable remainder trust a little bit over uh, uh, the head of this particular show, but it's a way to put a property in a trust, sell it, not pay the tax, and get a cash flow for life. 30 some odd years being a real estate investor. Yeah, and it's been- Every, every single property you owned was spectacular. Uh, no, not even close. <laughs> in fact, my first one was all right. I, I bought a single family home. It took about 11 years to double. I did sell that and then buy a, a, a small pro a apartment with it, seven unit apartment, uh, which almost doubled within three years. So I felt, gosh, I, re I really know what I'm doing here. <laughs> and then I 1031 that property into a 16 unit apartment. Something happened that I didn't anticipate. It was called the Great Recession. Oh. And that that was not so good. Right? And then the and big I, wallet on Big Al. It disappeared, disappeared for a while. Well, did you have a guy living in your house or living in one of your places that uh, parked his Harley yes. in the in the living room? Second rental. I thought, okay, I got this landlording thing down, right? And, but I, I hadn't, right? I hadn't checked it out well enough. And so I, I had this guy. So he rented my property. He didn't even pay the first month's rent. I got a deposit. That's all I got. So I made that mistake. Uh, when I tried to kick him out, he contested. I had to go to court. I did kick him out. When I finally got the property back, brand new carpet. He parked his Harley in the living room. I had to replace the carpet because there's oil spills all over the place. It's not as easy as you think. Big Al right there. We just <laughs> heard his life story. Um, go to yourmoneyandwealth.com. Um, we have more stories with Big Al. Uh, but more importantly, if you want to get your real estate tips guide, uh, go to Your Money or Wealth. Click on that special offer. You can download it right there. So if you're interested in real estate, we're trying to give you all the resources that you need. Don't go anywhere. We're going to talk about how do you invest real estate inside your retirement account? Is it good? Is it bad? Figure it out when we get back. Show's called Your Money or Wealth. Hey, welcome back to the show. The show's called Your Money or Wealth. Joe Anderson, Alan Klopine hanging out. Uh, we're talking real estate. We're getting real with real estate. And if you ever considered about buying real estate, a hard asset, uh, inside your retirement account, you don't want to miss this segment. But before we get into that, let's see how you did on the true-false question. As a rule of thumb, you should look for properties where the monthly rent is at least 1% of the total purchase price. Uh, and Joe, that is true. That's a good rule of thumb. So what that means is that if your property is worth $100,000, you'd like to rent it for at least 1000 bucks a month. If it's worth a million bucks, you'd like to get 10000 per month. Now, that's a general rule of thumb for properties around the country. If you can find that in San Diego County, let me know, because I've spent 30 years looking for it. I still haven't found it. Ten grand a month for a million dollar property. That would be challenging. It would, it, yeah, in our in our location, it would be. Now, I have I've have been close in San Diego in terms of like an apartment building, but a single family home, I have not seen that. But there are places like Texas, Arizona, for example, where it's it, you actually can get that sort of cash flow. Hey, let's get into this um, and send your hate mail to alanclopine.com because I know a lot of you love to buy real estate inside your retirement account. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about all the issues and problems uh, that people have when they do it. So let's uh, rapid fire this off, bud. Uh, number one issue for buying real estate in retirement is? Well, I'm, I'm going to say you don't have to. I mean, you can do it. I'm just going to tell you what the problems are, right? So you get a self-directed IRA. But here is what the problems are. And I got like eight or nine of them. <laughs> so get ready. So here's the first thing. You must pay all cash for the property. So you really can't get financing. And if you think about it, that's how you make money in real estate. In a lot of cases, you're borrowing, you're using other people's money. In an IRA, you got to pay all cash for the property. Well, so that's not necessarily true. If I have leverage inside a property in my retirement account, isn't that UBIT tax? 
Uh, yes, I mean, if, if you're able to put one in. A, a lot of the, um, the self-directed custodians won't allow well, it, won't accept but it. you're right. I mean, that's, that's a whole nother level. That's advanced. Hey, thank you very much. <laughs> Number two. Okay, the annual income that you receive from your IRA is taxed as ordinary income. And if you think about it, if you have the property outside of your retirement account, some of that may actually be tax-free. Why? Because of depreciation. There is no such thing as depreciation inside of the IRA. Depreciation simply means you take a piece of the property, you get to write it off over 27 and a half years, so it's what we call a non-cash deduction. So you take your income, reduce it with depreciation, and some is tax-free. Yeah, but I, I can also argue that too, Al, because the income I'm not paying tax on at all. It's all deferred. Until I start pulling the dollars out, then that's when it would be taxed at ordinary income rates. So if I'm buying and flipping my homes inside my retirement account, it would all be tax-free essentially until I start taking distributions. Tax deferred, not tax free. Tax deferred. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Number three, profits on the sale are taxed at ordinary income. Remember, ordinary income rates are the highest of rates. Capital gain rates are much cheaper, in some cases, almost half of, of regular rates. So think about this, when your uh, property is inside of a, an IRA and you sell it, and if you want to take those proceeds out, it's all ordinary income. You never get a capital gain on that. But if I keep it in the IRA, Alan, I'm not paying tax because it's deferred. Next. But you will. <laughs> I will. You will at 70 and a half. I'm just saying, some people are sitting in their couch right now going, Globe Biden doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. <laughs> so I'm just speaking for them. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah. Okay, this is another big one because when you own a property outside of a retirement account, if you pass away, there's what's called a step up in basis. So the next generation gets a step up in cost basis. They can sell the property at that point and pay no tax. Inside the IRA, there is no step up in basis. And so therefore, any money coming out of the IRA, for even for your beneficiaries, is taxed at ordinary income. Yeah, without a doubt. It's IRD tax, income and respected decedent for uh uh, beneficiaries. So. You got no rebuttal on that one? No, you're, you're right on, brother. <laughs> okay, so another one is re required minimum distributions. We know that happens at 70 and a half. You have to take money out of your IRA whether you want to or not. What if you got property in your IRA and there's not enough cash to cover your required minimum distribution? You got a problem because now you can't make your distribution. There's a 50% penalty. There's a 6% excise tax, all kinds of problems. Right, you can't take a, like the kitchen out of the retirement account. And to, say, okay, that's my RMD. That's my RMD, right? I, it's I, to be cash. I like this refrigerator right. because it's stainless steel. Yeah, yeah, vacancies, there's no cash in the IRA, there's no cash flow coming in, right? And it's like, what do I do? So yeah, you blow yourself up big time there. Uh, another one is repairs, Joe, must be paid out of the IRA. So you actually have, a, have to have a cash account inside the IRA to pay for, for repairs. You cannot pay for repairs yourself because that would be like an IRA contribution, which you may or may not qualify. And something you may not even know about is you're not even allowed to make the repairs yourself. You actually have to hire somebody because that would be a prohibited transaction if you're doing it yourself. Sham. Yeah, it's Total a sham. sham. Yeah, we don't want that. And here's, uh, here's, here's another one. Uh, let's see if I can get there. Is um, No personal use. You can't even drive by it. Can't even look at it. You can do that. Just start step foot on the property. <laughs> don't, yes, don't even go to the property. Right? It's it's there, but you can't even touch it. You can't repair it. You can't have debt on it. Um, so there's a lot more negatives and positive. Uh, but by all means, if you love real estate and that's your deal, um, and if you have cash in your retirement account, you can. But it has to be a self-directed IRA. It's completely complex. Al and I are not huge fans. Uh, let's go to ask the experts before we get out of here. Okay, for the future of my grandkids, I was wondering if it's best to have educational accounts versus investment accounts. I would say it doesn't necessarily matter. I guess what's the goal? Um, uh, I would like, if it's for education, then you could go to a 529 plan. It would grow 100% tax deferred and tax free if used for education. So that might be a good use of the funds. If the kid doesn't go to school, well, then you could give it to another kid. Or if he takes it out, there's penalties and taxes. So maybe an investment account might be better. So it depends on the goals. Uh, let's go to the next one. 
This is from Cheryl, San Marcos. I have several rental properties. What's the best way for me to pass them along to my children and avoid paying ex excessive taxes? Uh, die. Yeah, well, that is the answer. And, and a lot of people want to give their properties before, I'll put that down there, before actually they pass away, don't do it. Because if you hold the properties to end of life, the kids will get a step up in basis. And remember, right now it's roughly $11 million can pass to the next generation without a state tax and the kids get a step up in basis. If you're married, $22 million goes to the next generation. So basically, wait till you, you pass away. If that's not acceptable, there's more sophisticated strategies, limited family limited partnerships. But in most cases, for most people, just hold the properties till you pass away, and then the kids will get them with a step up in basis. So what did we learn today, folks? What is the pure takeaway? Well, if you do have home, right, you might be able to utilize the overall equity within the home with a reverse mortgage or downsizing. If you are considering rental real estate, look at cash on cash or cap rates, right? And then finally, if you're going to buy an IRA or buy a, a, a rental property or investment property inside your retirement account, just make sure you know the pros and cons. Make sure you know the pros and cons, folks. Well, that's it. We got real with real estate today, folks. Hopefully you enjoyed the show. We'll be back again next week. For Big Al Clopin, I'm Joe Anderson. And I want to thank Aaron for this lovely tie that Al and I are matchy-matchy today. Thank you, buddy. I really appreciate that. You just watched another phenomenal episode of Your Money, Your Wealth.